Amen, amen, amen. If we could go ahead and have our seats. I'm going to pray and then we'll get into the word of God. Father, we are grateful for you. You are kind and gracious and loving to us and you provide us um, with abundant grace because of your son Jesus who uh, gave himself as a ransom who paid the sin debt that we incurred by sacrificing himself on the cross so that all those who have faith in the Son would have their sin debt forgiven they will be made right again with God, reconciled to him, be adopted as sons and daughters by God, and be saved from your wrath, from Satan, and from sin's power. That's the good news that I need to preach to myself every day. Because every morning I wake up and my flesh compels me to forget the good news of Jesus. And I allow my circumstances to dictate my mood rather than truth dictating my mood. I allow my circumstances to govern whether or not I'm going to be gracious with my children and my wife and my, my, my friends and my family. I let, I let everything else govern me except for the truth of the gospel. And so we, we repeat the gospel to ourselves every day, every morning. The desire is to wake up and to speak the truth of Jesus' love and sacrifice for the likes of a wretch like me. That I would fall on my knees in awe that you would save someone like me, that you would be tortured for someone like me. Because I'm a low down dirty dog in so many ways. I'm just a man like everybody else. And I do human things. And I need the gospel as much as any man, as much as any person. And these people, Lord, they need the gospel too. They need it to govern their life, not just their Sunday. Not just their three hours, two hours, one hour here. They need it to govern their day to day. And so, Lord, would you impress on our hearts to not only know the truth of the gospel, but that that truth would govern us day after day after day. Every morning we would preach it to ourselves again and again so we cannot forget your kindness and your love. That we would not be puffed up with pride because we know what we were. That we would be patient and kind because you were patient and kind with us. That we would desire to exemplify the, the fruit of the Spirit because of the work of the Lord within us. And that we would actively, consciously fight against the desires of the flesh within us. That we would preach that good news of the gospel and that we would share it with everybody we know, the people we know and our, our loved ones. How could we have such good news and not tell them? Unless we don't believe it. Jesus, you are Lord. And that's final. And I'm so glad that you're Lord, and I'm not. I can't do nothing right, Lord. So I turn to you. I give you all of me. We give you the highest praise. You are worthy of it. Lord, we thank you. Remind us of this truth. Fill us with your spirit. Encourage us through your word. We submit to you, Lord, and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, amen. Good morning, good morning, fellow church. My name is Canaan Parker. If you could open up in your copy of God's Word to the book of 1 Peter. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 5. Today is a unique day in the body life of Pillar Church. This is a unique day. Uh, today is the day that we get to install an elder. It's our first time installing an elder here at Pillar Church. And so this morning... 
I'm going to spend time talking to that man. He's seated right over there if you want to know with the bald head, my boy Martiche Gaston. Yeah. So I'm going to talk to Martiche this morning, but I'm going to talk to you too. And I hope that it's instructful for him, but that it's informative and instructful for all of us as well. Usually I preach for about 55 minutes. You can expect that today. No, I'm playing. I have no idea how long this was. I shouldn't have made any promises. Y'all in 1 Peter chapter 5? We're going to be looking at the first few verses of 1 Peter chapter 5. Starting in verse 1, this is what the Word of God says. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder in witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Stop there. Martyrship, that word exhort means urge, right? It means uh, to compel you to something. It means to earnestly call somebody, to uh, implore, to almost in a sense to beg you of something. The apostle Peter is talking to elders of the churches that he's writing to. And as a fellow elder, he's about to say something of great importance to them. And as elders... We have to heed his words with the utmost importance as well. This is what he says. There's three parts to his instruction. In verse 1, he says, I exhort the elders among among you. And so I am and Peter exhorting you as a fellow elder and as a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Verse 2. Shepherd God's flock among you. Those three things. Shepherd God's flock among you. This is the duty of the pastor, the elder, the bishop to shepherd God's flock. We can't let the imagery of a shepherd be lost on us in this text. When you hear the word shepherd, you need to think of a shepherd. A shepherd is someone who tends to sheep. This is what they do. They raise sheep. They lead sheep. A shepherd is a man who's responsible for feeding the sheep, for shearing the sheep, right? For protecting the sheep, for leading the sheep in travel. When you hear the word shepherd, think in your mind, this is a dirty job. Think dirty. A shepherd is knee-deep in sheep dander. Shepherd's shirt is dirty from helping the sheep cross mud piles. A shepherd's eyes are oftentimes weary and tired as they have to constantly keep watch for threats against his sheep. A shepherd would even sometimes, and if you know anything about shepherds, they would even sometimes have wounds bite marks on their arms and their legs, as sometimes the sheep that they care for will even bite them. You don't learn how to be a shepherd from shepherding theory class in seminary. You don't learn how to be a shepherd in shepherding 101 class. The task is something that you learn as you do in many ways. You know how doctors have residency programs for two to seven years based on their their, their, their concentration. It's a very similar thing that they, our, our, our education system knows that after a, an MD is done with school, he's not ready to practice. He got to go and get his hands dirty in the residency program for two to seven years with under the leadership of other doctors before they're ever ready to serve anybody. Praise God that this is how they do it. And this is a reality for shepherds in the church as well, because the task is hard. The in and outs of the task of shepherding are honed in the dirt on the pasture. This is where you learn it. And this is precisely why Peter is telling us and telling you, and he's instructing the flock as a whole. God's people are his flock. And the task of the pastor or the elders to accompany God in shepherding and caring for his sheep. The job of a shepherd is to lead the sheep where he wants them to go. That's the job. That is the primary task of a shepherd. Lead the sheep 
through the word and prayer to wherever it is that the chief shepherd wants them to be. And the chief shepherd, as we know from the scriptures, wants you to be close to Jesus. That's where he wants the sheep to be. He wants you all close to Jesus. He wants you biblically nourished. He wants you spiritually and physically protected. He wants you tenderly loved and prayed for. So as shepherds, our job is to lead people closer to Jesus and each other in accordance with Ephesians chapter 2 and chapter, and chapter 4. We're to feed God's people God's word, according to Matthew chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4. Our job is to refute false teachers who unduly influence God's people, whether that be cult leaders in our community, whether it be influencers who are just led astray, whether it be false value systems or worldviews or political leaders. Our job is to guard our people from following them, but to lead them to following Jesus first. Everything else is secondary, tertiary at best. We're to call our people to holiness, even when they don't want to be holy. We're to love our people with our presence and our prayers. And we're to bear the burdens of our people. This is a gloriously taxing task. And you will have many nights of crying. Because I do. You must be called by God to do this. Otherwise, you will quit. Or you will fall in moral failure. Because the pressures of leading people where God wants them to go is weighty. And it's scary. Because all these people here, we are held accountable for them who have covenanted with us as partners at Pillar. Even the Apostle Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. He, the Apostle Paul says he daily feels the pressures of the church on his shoulders. And if he feels it, how much so are we going to feel that? And our proximity to Jesus will be the only thing that will hold us strong to grow, not grow weary in well-doing. And that's why Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 to watch our life and to watch our doctrine. This is what he tells us to do. And to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. This is one of the reasons why, for the sake of the sheep, we do ministry a particular way here. And we're not afraid to change how we do it because our duty is to lead the sheep in whatever condition they may be closer to Jesus. And so as the shepherds have a vantage point that can see the swath of sheep and see whether or not they're being led closer to Jesus, it's done the impetus of the elders to, to change it, the methodology by which we use to lead you to where God wants you to be. At Pillar Church, we're never going to marry a method. We marry the goal. We'll marry the, the goal, but the method we will date. We will use this because as the body grows, we change how we do. And when your child grows, you don't give them mashed pears and peaches anymore, do you? You change how the meal is presented to them. And in the same way, we will do things a certain way. And the goal is this. Get you as close to Jesus and as ready to, to wield the word of God at a whim's notice as, possib as possible. That is what we will do. And that is hard. Because as people, we like what we like. And we like routine often. But just know that things shift. Things will change. Things will move as you grow and mature. As the body moves, we will move along with it. As our community shifts, we will shift in certain ways to best impact that community. But the goal will never change. We, will, we, are, we are dead earnest about leading people closer to Jesus and each other in this place toward these people who live on these streets and in these blocks and serving them, those who cannot and do not have a voice for themselves. We will do that. You will do that. How? It might look different next month, next year, two years, ten years. But as long as there's people without a voice, we will speak for them. As long as the word of God is before us, we will proclaim it and live by it. This is what we will do. And it's hard. Notice the who in the passage. 
1 Peter 5, 2 says, shepherd, God's flock, where? Among you. This has given us a theology of proximity, right? Just as it's impossible to actually live out the biblical one another's with each other, if we're not with each other, in the same way, the elders cannot shepherd the sheep that are not there, that are not in proximity to the elders. This is one of the reasons why we have church membership, so that we know before God who it is we are responsible for chasing should they stray. Those who become members of a local church are those who desire to be led by the shepherds of that local church. But Marta say, you know what I learned over the years? Everyone wants to be led until you lead them. And that's true for me, and I know it's true for everybody else. Everybody wants change until you change. Our duty as shepherds is to endure that. Our duty as shepherds is to sit back, look, and say, no, this is what's best for the body and for the community, even if it's an uncomfortable season. Our our job is to pull back and see the full vantage point and understand the full weight of what it is that, that is facing this church and this community and to lead out in that and not to be swayed by anyone other than the Spirit of God himself. And if we have to stand alone, we stand alone, bro. Period. Because we're not here to please anybody here. We're here to glorify the king first. In so doing, our flesh will try to grab a hold of us. And so we have to be gentle as doves. We have to lead in compassion, knowing that not everybody will have the same vantage point that you will have. 1 Peter 5, verses 2 through 3 says, Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. When I first worked on this text, I spent about 15 pages just, uh, just working out those things, and I cut them to the chase. The last phrase is the point. We have to be an example to the flock. Mardashe, your life will be the most compelling case for the gospel, along with the text, period. Your walk will give clarity to your talk. I'm sorry, your talk will give clarity to your walk, but your walk will lend credibility to your talk. No one follows a hypocrite. And so your life will make a compelling case for the gospel, just as compelling as your words will. And in order to be an example to the flock, we are committing to being in close proximity to the flock. We as elders of Pillar Church are called to be hands-on with the people to the best of our ability. Because these people, they will all find better preaching online. We got a a, a swath of gifted, godly men online. But hear me on this one. Remember this truth. We are their shepherds, not those preachers. We are their pastors, not those preachers. To all the elders of Pillar Church, remember this. Those gifted preachers won't be there to cry with our people, but we will. They won't be there when tragedy strikes our people, but we will. They won't be there to celebrate with our people, but we will. They won't be there to bury our people and their loved ones, but we will. Those preachers will not open up their lives to our people, but we will. Those preachers will never be criticized by our people, but we will. Those preachers will never fail in the sight of our people, but we will. Those preachers will never chase our wayward sheep, but we will. They will never fast for the salvation of our people and and their loved ones, but we will. They won't be up all night praying with tears before their eyes that our people's faith will not fail, but we will. We are their pastors. And we can't leave it to anybody else to shepherd them. The task is heavy. It's scary. It's weighty. But it's such a blessing. 
Look what 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4 says. This is our promise. But when the chief shepherd appears, we will receive the unfading crown of glory. Martyrs say the task that you're about to embark in will cause spiritual warfare for your family until the Lord calls you home. We've talked about that. And I am so joyful to be able to do this work and fight this fight alongside you. I think our body speaks as we, a couple months ago, put it before them to testify of your character and testify they did. The leading comments were that this man shepherds his family like no one else, that this man invited me into his home and stayed with me all night and prayed with me when I wasn't expecting it. That this man loves Jesus and is gentle. And I say a hearty amen to those three and the 50 other ones that we got. And so today, the elders that are here, myself, Pastor Derek, unfortunately, Pastor Eric's not here today because of circumstances that are beyond everybody's control. Um, we will lay our hands on you and you will lead these people. I'm going to pray. And as I pray, if you all can make your way to the back, that would be great. Father, there's so much in 1 Peter chapter 5 that we could have talked about that we, I would normally expound on. But the reality, of, the reality of the weight of this morning is significant. And we don't want to pull anything away from it. Lord, you are calling a man and his family to lead people closer to you. And I'm praying that you would not only affirm his calling and election, but that you would make his work in leading these people successful in your sight. That he would shepherd God's flock that he would smell like sheep, love the sheep, protect the sheep, sacrifice for the sheep, lead the sheep, feed the sheep, guide the sheep, instruct the sheep, care for the sheep, pray for the sheep, give his life for the sheep, because that's what a shepherd does. And it's scary and it's hard. Now we would stand on your word, despite what any man says, because you've called us to this task. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen.